Welcome back to a brand new episode of Popcorn Podcast with Lee and Tim. It's time to put a towel under your seat, friends, because we're going to talk challenges. It's about to get moist in here. (laughs) I'm Timmy Fland, movie buff. And I'm Lee Livingstone, entertainment journalist. And we love to talk all things movies. And better than that, we love to talk all things movies with you, dear listener. In Challenges, Tashi Duncan, a former tennis prodigy turned coach, makes no apologies for her game on and off the court. Married to a champion on a losing streak, Tashi's strategy for her husband's redemption takes a surprising turn when he must face off against the washed-up Patrick, his former best friend and Tashi's former boyfriend. As their pasts and present collide and tensions run high, Tashi must ask herself, what will it cost to win? Challenges is directed by Luca Guadagnino, who has brought us such films as Call Me By Your Name and Bones and All, and it's from a screenplay by Justin Kuritskis. Challenges stars Zendaya, Josh O'Connor and Mike Feist. So there's been so much buzz about this film mm. for a few reasons. You have Luca Guadagnino's follow-up to Bones and All, mm-hmm. uh, which was one of my favourite movies of a couple of years ago. Decidedly less cannibalism in this <laughs> film, though. <laughs> Decidedly less. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yeah. There's no cannibalism. But they do suck face in a very different kind of <laughs> way, I guess. Uh, you've got Zendaya in this one. She's one of the biggest stars yeah. in the world. So all eyes on this woman, whatever she decides to do. Yep. And you have Mike Feist and Josh O'Connor. They're so hot right now, too. <laughs> but... Mm. Really frustratingly, this movie was actually meant to come out end of last year. I think it was October, Mm -hmm. but it was pushed back due to the strikes. So Mm. we've kind of been waiting for this movie for a while. So everything's kind of heating up. Yes. And it's exciting to note that we were among the first in the world to see it Mm. down here in Sydney on the press tour. The stars were in town to attend the glitzy premiere. We were on the red carpet. Make sure you check out that video. It was great to see it in that atmosphere. With, with all the hype and people screaming and fans going nuts for Zendaya. She looked incredible, of course. Uh, she was um, serving uh, on the red carpet. <laughs> There's going to be a myriad of uh, tennis puns, no doubt, in this episode. Yeah. But you know what? One thing that was really exciting was that the cast, it was the first time they were seeing the film with an audience. That's right. So that's really exciting to know that, one, the actors kind of hung around to watch the film with mm-hmm. everyone else because my idea of premieres like that is that they just – she was sitting just behind us. Didn't you see that? Yeah. Well, <laughs> she offered me some popcorn uh, in the second act. I was, I was like, uh, no thanks. No, no <laughs> thanks. Let's go back to the beginning, right? This film is inspired by a controversial match between Serena Williams and Naomi Osaka where it was alleged that Williams was receiving coaching from the sidelines. Mm. And that's where that idea comes from, that there's someone, Tashi, on the sidelines heavily invested in which side of Ooh. this match, you know, who does she really want to win? Do we know? Do we ever know? To give you an idea of of what you're in for, let me just sum it up with this line from one of the characters. Okay. Referring to Tashi Duncan, he says, I'd let her fuck me with a racket. (laughs) And so sets the tone of challenges. (laughs) Can we talk about the tone? Because that is the perfect line to pull out. And gee, the, the audience interaction with this was really fun. And I wasn't expecting the type of film that we got Mm. because it was quite funny. It was very playful and cheeky. Yes. And very, very sexy. Yeah. There were so many choices creatively and artistically here that you don't expect the product that you get that you get back. It's it's a three way. You get two Mm. handers in film, but this is a a three hander. Yes. In more ways than one. (laughs) It's very (laughs) see what you did there. The tension is so tight as you wonder what choice each of these characters will make. And and they're always making bad choices, really. Well, Well, I mean, mean, what you perceive to be a bad choice. What you perceive to be bad. And that's what Lucas films play in so nicely is that sort of moral playground that his Mm. characters decide to dance around. And whether you're meant to agree or cheer on certain characters' motivations and decisions that they make, it's still really, really fun to be part of it and witness it because – they're making a selfish decision or they're making one that's purely around taking control or power. Yeah. Decisions made purely around lust. Yeah. So it, it's a really complex sort of narrative in terms of what the characters bring to the table. And you're sitting there, you're willing them to do the right thing, mm. quote unquote. Yes. 
or the wrong thing if you've got a chaotic personality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like us. <laughs> like us. <laughs> but the, the point is you're invested. You're really invested in these three characters and what they're mm. going to do next. Mm. It's not a linear story either. Mm. The timeline jumps all over the place, which can get a little bit confusing sometimes, I found. Uh, what part of that non-linear narrative did you struggle to latch onto, if anything? There were just a couple of moments where, you know, it, it doesn't jump between past and present. It actually jumps between three, four different timelines, I think. It's quite layered like that. There's quite a lot of timelines. And I yeah. think you've got to try and remember what came before what part. Yes, and what hairstyle is linked to what <laughs> Yes. <laughs> on the timeline. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So some things were happening that are informing the choices and the motivations of the characters later on. Yes. But you're not quite sure where that falls in their timeline. Yeah. It was quite a devilish choice in a few ways. I quite like non-linear storytelling yes. because it doesn't serve you up on a silver platter. Mm-hmm. This is where the characters are all right now. This is how they're feeling and this is the context behind it all. You are introduced to these characters in the present day i'm pretty sure is one of the first scenes but the tension the -hmm. context behind their motivations their reactions never really fully unravels the truth is slowly slowly peppered and Mm. the impact of this challenges tennis match that everything's building up to really takes shape and molds itself over the life of the film Mm. it's it's a pretty compelling way of telling the story because it's so complex it absolutely is and I enjoyed it very much. Mm. Uh, I just found some parts started to get a bit muddy watered, yes. I guess. And the anchor, as you said, is this challenges mm. match. It's all leading up to this challenges match. We get a sense in the beginning of the film of the journey that each of these characters has taken. So Tashi and Art are a power brand with their daughter. Mm. Patrick is down on his luck. I don't think it does a great job, though, of taking us on the journey of these characters beyond their teen years. You know, it's so focused on their interpersonal relationship with each other and that central dynamic that it forgoes who they are Mm. beyond who they were Yes, when we first meet them. Does that make sense? Am I explaining Mm. that properly? Yeah. Do you think that even though there are, let's say, four timelines that we're exploring, there's the opportunity to actually show more of their life was missing. Yes, absolutely. And that's because like I quite like tennis. I like watching tennis. It's weird. Mm. I know you're like, what do you mean? Yeah, no, I'm not. sports. I'm not a tennis fan. Well, you did have to um, whisper in my ear going, what does this mean in terms of like the (laughs) points, especially at the end? I had no idea. It's quite straightforward, but you need to get your head around, especially the advantage (laughs) Juice, that sort of. Um, it's actually stuff. easy, Lee, and you're just stupid. <laughs> Is that what you're trying to say? I'm saying? When the penny drops, you're like, "Oh, I get tennis." Whereas a lot of sports <laughs> rules for me, I'm like, "Fuck, I don't know." They're kicking a ball around. I've no idea. Sports ball offside. It's like, fuck off. I don't know what that means. I actually still don't know what being offside means in like any <laughs> sports game because it seems like everyone's got a different interpretation of that. But anyway, I would have liked to have seen. Um, For example, Mike Feist's character, he's meant Mm. to be, he developed into this incredible tennis player. He's won every tournament except the US Open, that elusive final trophy that he wants to win before he, you know, retires or not retires. And I just wanted to watch some of that. So uh, throw a montage. Yeah, I wanted to see that. I just freaking love a sports montage. So maybe that's what this film needed. Gotta have a montage. (laughs) Is that an SNL skit? America. Fuck yeah. Oh, what is in... Team America, World Police. Oh, my God. Yeah. I love that film so much. It's very funny. That it's very that funny. Soon. <laughs> That's quite sexy, too, in places. Yeah. <laughs> Puppet <laughs> sex. That's right. Okay. <laughs> I'm going down a spiral now. Building on that and, and understanding these characters throughout the years, Tashi bounces between these two men. You know, one represents the exciting boyfriend of youth, the first love. Mm. He's he's the bad guy. He's chaotic. He's really sexy. Yeah. Is he, Lee? I, did the drop in your voice there? I, I don't think. <laughs> Is think it I, your time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't think I'd ever say that about someone who's played Prince Charles before. <laughs> oh, Christ. Yeah, in, in The Crown. That's Ugh. right. Oh. Anyway, moving on. The other is this grown-up <laughs> love and stability. He yes. represents the husband, okay? Mm. And these two men have their own history with each other, which is actually never fully explored either beyond the mentioning of this pseudo-sexual mm. encounter they had as young teen roommates, you know? Yeah. 
it does lean into that whole thing around toxic masculinity mm. and boys, you know, is there that sort of curiosity there between touch, them? Touch of repressed homophobia maybe? Yeah, yeah. All, all those things. Uh, and it is exciting. I wonder whether the film lacked depth in that area. But I just want to call out something about the whole sexual tension and stuff, which is mm. there and it's palpable. Oh, yeah. I got a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> oh my God, sound effects are going places in this episode. Face. I don't know what that was supposed <laughs> I don't to know. be. I, thirsty, um, you know what that reminds me of? The film with Penelope Cruz where they like kiss into the oh, microphone. Is it official competition? Yeah. Yeah, the kissings, <laughs> the slapping of those lips and tongues. Well, okay. Oh, God. Yeah, that was a lot, wasn't it? Um, But intentional, I feel. There's so much kissing in this film, yes. in Challenges. There is like an uncomfortable amount of kissing. Somebody check on Tom Holland, okay? Yeah, you see how... <laughs> Zendaya probably came home from work and being like, and he's like, oh, how was work, babe? And give me a kiss. And she's like, I've done too much kissing today. So <laughs> I can't you can kiss, kiss you. Unless you want to kiss Mike Feist and <laughs> Josh O'Connor along with me. Yeah. But this isn't necessarily a spoiler because there is sexual tension. There's a lot of kissing. There's mm. a lot of like gyrating and stuff. But there's no sex in this movie. And for mm. a movie that is out on the promotional tour, saying how sexy it is, which it is, mm. I'm like, but where – was the actual sex. And mm. I found that really interesting. I've come out going, no one fucked in this film. <laughs> and I thought that that was going to be a lot of that. And there yeah. wasn't. You so. got a bit worried at the beginning when the racket was mentioned. Oh, my God. I was like, this is <laughs> not what I signed please, up for. <laughs> please don't show us that. I was like, each their own. But yeah. no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Getting off track. Going back to, you know, talking about fleshing out these characters and, sure. and their motivations and things. Okay. They also don't really fully explain why the boys aren't in touch anymore. I mean, it's it, mm. like it's kind of alluded to. You can put two and two together. Yeah. But it is never really explored why these two friends mm. who were so close. They were called Fire and Ice on the court, for yeah. God's sake. They were doubles players together. Yeah. yeah. Why they suddenly weren't in touch anymore. Do you think it's a case of there was no clear answer and we needed one? Or is it just a case of a friendship that just fell apart for a few reasons and we don't actually... Like it just ended like some friendships mm. do. But I think for a film that is building itself on the interpersonal relationships of these three characters and yeah. and how messy and complicated it is, you could explore some of that messiness and complicated stuff a bit more, yeah. I think. Yeah, and another scene within the sports montage that we're missing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about the pulsating soundtrack a bit later on. Ooh, yeah. But the way they switch up the pace in this film from slow motion to fast serves and then the pulsating soundtrack, it doesn't it doesn't let you get comfortable, does it, in no. this film? It, you're almost leaning in to see what's going to happen next. Mm, mm. There's a lot of close-ups and that sort of kinetic camera movement. Yes. Yeah. It's kinetic and frenetic. Kinetic and frenetic. Yeah. There was a weird choice though where we were like on the ball. There was like this point of view <laughs> yeah. shot. Did you feel that just yes. came out of – Nowhere? Yes, because there was another shot as well they chose to use where you were the point of view of the player. Yes. You got player POV. Mm. That was quite effective, I think. One of them I felt was not effective and one of them was effective and I can't quite remember now, but I feel like there was one where people started laughing. Was mm. that the tennis ball one? Oh, I, I, I know Well, you the became moment. the tennis ball. And you it became was the <laughs> tennis ball. It felt very video game. Yes. And even though the style of this is very much present and the choices that they make, like you mentioned music, we'll talk about that mm. later, but the kinetic, frenetic use of the camera, even though that was quite bold, it did feel a bit, oh, it felt quite jarring and, yes. un and uncomfortable that we were literally the ball or the player <laughs> in that sense. They did nail the tension of the tennis oh, matches yeah. though, especially it was just incredible. I was on the edge of my seat throughout mm. the tennis. Like I thought the balls were coming at me and it, it came down to also all the moving parts, but the sound design was like, it was so sharp. Yeah. The slap of that ball on the court and the grunting and the scuttering of the feet, like it yep. was really, really exciting. Thank you, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross for the soundtrack. Yes. Two-time Oscar winners, obviously, for their films Soul and uh, The Social Network. Mm. It's quite a mix of films, isn't it? Which just shows their mm. incredible range as artists. It's a lot of techno, basically. But it gets your heart pounding and it pulls you along. It's just extremely effective. You know, the competition heats up and then the score builds momentum in time with it. 
Did you know that Guadagnino actually wrote the lyrics for the last song too in the film? Oh. It's called Compress, Repress. Oh. It wraps up the film. Yeah, exactly. It wraps (laughs) up the film really well. The lyrics are along the lines of one, two, three and variations of that. And it just cements how interwoven these three characters are Mm. emotionally and and physically and all that jazz. And just on the music as well Mm. and how that weaves into the tension and also what to expect in this film. Mm. There was no way I thought I was going to be walking into a Luca Guadagnino film where there was techno and electric on a music or whatever mm. because it's not everyone's cup of tea that type of music no do you think it worked in the product yes that was that it was delivering yes yeah. i think it was extremely effective yeah and not at all jarring for lack mm. of a better word it, uh, it doesn't pull you out of it it was it was very smooth mm. but also very obvious very obvious. It's it, not subtle at it, all. It went balls to the wall. Like it did not shy away from going, we're going hard and mm. fast here. But then it's also the marriage of some popular music. A, again, a reaction of the audience was when Hot In Here started playing <laughs> at the party yeah. and there's the slow-mo and the boys are just absolutely in a trance um, of her yes. dancing and knowing that they're watching, you know, so and just putting on a show like that. So early 2000 teens, man. That was... 100%. It really me. felt like that. <laughs> <laughs> In my low-rise jeans and my handkerchief top. Oh, the visuals. Yeah. So good. When Luca Guadagnino reached out to Reznor and Ross, he described the film as a very sexy movie with multiple X's, lots and mm. lots of X's. And, oh boy, did he get a score to match. Oh, absolutely. Speaking of Guadagnino, his films are often about the agonies of youth, aren't they? Mm. The messy, the obsessive, the ecstasy, the pain, sometimes with a twist of horror or other darkness. Mm. This one's more about the darkness within the soul. (laughs) Oh, gee, we're going deep. (laughs) Well, I guess it's it's not darkness, is it really? It's just messy human condition, isn't it? Absolutely. He revels in that space of messy characters and messy people who make decisions for like what intention and the ramifications that come with that. And it's beautiful chaos. Mm. It's absolutely beautiful chaos. His films are the definition of hot mess. (laughs) (laughs) Really? But how are they so profound at the same time? He invites you to sit in a space. Mm. Like I think, I always think back about that final scene in Call Me By Your Name where you're just sitting with Timothy Chalamet by the fire after that Mm. really beautiful conversation with his dad. In this one, there's a fight scene, one long take, really, really impressive, you know, in the dormitory room, if you can recall. And it's just one long take. It starts with them kind of fooling around and then they go head to head and bash Mm. heads about something and one long take, the blocking's amazing and it's a really complex sort of just a little window into an argument of a couple who are maybe on the edge of being together or not. Mm-mm. And and it's quite confronting at times because he doesn't let you take a breath because his no. characters aren't taking a breath. And then the soundtrack also doesn't mm. let you take a breath. Not at all. He really likes working with these complicated characters, doesn't he? And, yeah. and somewhat, I want to hesitate in saying unlikable characters. Mm. Like... There's some decisions that maybe some of the characters make that you think you could judge very easily, I guess. Mm. But he doesn't shy away from the selfishness and the compulsiveness of, of humanity, if, if you want to look at it that way, I guess. Yeah, and it's a fun playground to be in a competitive sort of world like tennis offers. Mm. So it adds another layer of intensity to it, but there would be a really st- uh, compelling story of characters if you took tennis away. But if you add tennis and the kinetic sort of mm. moving piece that is tennis, it pairs up so nicely with that beautiful chaos, that messy, messy world of characters and, and the morals around it. And Guadagnino has said, I don't know much about tennis, but I know a lot about desire. Mm. And that is really evident in challenges. Yeah. And so and his other work as well. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about the characters now. Tashi. She's the one I think can come across as unlikable. She's fiercely driven she's competitive she's intelligent she's free with her sexuality and often these traits are despised in strong young women yeah she is also a little manipulative and and secretive and shady yeah about the way she goes about things all those things she likes control and she has that foresight in terms of how she can take advantage Mm. of a situation or people uh for good or bad it's Mm. i guess it's how you interpret it one of my favorite things about her was how steadfast she was Mm. and that she said things with absolute conviction. Yeah. One of the lines she says is, get your fucking confidence back. (laughs) Like she's cutthroat. She's straight down the line. And 
you never leave a room not knowing what is expected of you with her. Yeah, she has power in relationships and in her knowledge of tennis and she doesn't hesitate to exercise it ever. She's magnetic Mm. is a good word. It's actually refreshing to see a female character who is so unapologetic about who she is. Yeah, so good. From such a young age too. Mm, mm. And it can rub people the wrong way, but she knows her mind. She knows what she wants, as you said. And also she just wants to be as close to tennis as she can be and in control of it Yes, without playing. Obviously, it's kind of alluded to in the trailers, if you're familiar with that, is that she injures herself. She's like a tennis prodigy. Mm. And tennis as she knows it then and there and her life is taken away from her. Mm. But her relationship with the boys brings her closer to tennis Mm. and she becomes a coach, this absolute powerhouse. And so if her husband decides to retire from tennis... What does she do? What does she do? What Mm. what is her purpose? So even though she hasn't played tennis for many, many years, she's been playing in the world of tennis ever since. And so it's just this really interesting dynamic of someone who's ready to hang up their racket, but someone who isn't mm. and what comes out then in that scenario. Exactly. It's really interesting to watch. Mm. Then we have Patrick played by Josh O'Connor, who I mentioned previously we've seen in The Crown. We've also seen him putting on his shirt before his pants <laughs> in Mothering Sunday. That really upset us. If you listen to our Mothering <laughs> Sunday episode, you'll know what we're talking about. Yeah. How do you get dressed in the morning? <laughs> what order of manner? <laughs> <laughs> do you <laughs> place on your body? He's the hot guy, the hot mess. Yeah. Charming and charismatic, but total bad boy vibes. Total bad boy. He's got this raw, sexy confidence about him. Yeah. But that plays into his raw talent as a tennis player. He's a messy, angry tennis player. And we, we've mm. all, if you know tennis and watch tennis, you know those players that can't really mask their emotions and they're the ones smashing the racket on the court. And John McEnroe style. Uh, right. I mean, like even Leighton Hewitt, Australian tennis player, you know, was very Mm. emotional and it's an interesting sort of game to watch in that way because Mm. there's so much concentration and respect in that game and he kind of, Patrick kind of walks all over that in this and it's interesting to see. Yeah, and then on the other side of that fire, you have the ice, which is art, (laughs) played by Mike Feist, who we've seen in West Side Story. I found him to be a bit of a, the character, to be a bit of a wet drip and that's not the <laughs> fault of Mike Feist, no. but that his his motivations are sidelined for this central love triangle aspect. Mm. And I would have liked to have understood more about where he was at in his career. Do you think, though, because he was very much the puppet of his wife, of Zendaya's mm. character, that maybe his personality was never really able to be fleshed out because he was his wife? Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah because you have Patrick who you kind of get more of a personality or a suave to him, Mm. whether that's the right word or not. Yeah, but art is a bit more sort of controlled, I guess. Yes, controlled, I was going to say. And Mm. and he's talented. Very talented. He's he's more graceful in Mm. his playing. Nicely put. But he just doesn't have the passion that Tashi seems to have for the sport anymore, at least. And she resents him for that because Mm. she has so much passion for the game, even though she can't play professionally anymore. And so I guess you can appreciate how that might frustrate someone, but she's put all her eggs in one basket and it just happens to be her husband. Mm. So it's like once he starts throwing those eggs out of the basket, like what's left inside? How does she detangle herself from that? Exactly. Mm. And then decisions are made. Therein lies the drama (laughs) and the conflict. The push and pull of it all. (laughs) Shall we wrap up our review of Challenges, Tim? Let's do it, my friend. Challenges is a tense, exciting and sexy ride with however many X's you want to throw into the mix. If tennis isn't your thing, don't worry about it because there is so much to enjoy and shouldn't challenge your experience too much. Its trio of actors in Zendaya, Feist and O'Connor serves the film's biggest ace. Their chemistry together will go down in the history books, I think. This is another provocative film from Luca Guadagnino, whose ability to balance tone through his unique visual style is really impressive here. Although I can see this not working for everyone in some of the choices that it makes, but it's playful, cheeky, funny and sexy and why we go to the movies. I'm going to rate challenges for Popcorn Kernels. Well, you stole the word tense from me, but I'm going to use it again (laughs) anyway. Challenges is a tense, seductive three-way driven by solid performances from its stars and a pulsating soundtrack that will make you want to rave down the cinema aisle (laughs) if you weren't so firmly glued to the edge of your seat. 
An average love triangle, this is not. Luca Guadagnino crafts a playfully directed drama that is unapologetically messy and sexy with all those X's that you mentioned before. I'm going to give challenges four popcorn kernels out of five too. There we go. There you go. Nice wrap up. Well, challenges is in Australian cinemas from April 18, friends. And be sure to check out our Australian premiere red carpet coverage over on our YouTube channel now. You might get a glimpse of Zendaya Ooh. serving on that red carpet with that gorgeous dress with the mm-hmm. tennis design. She came as a tennis court. Have you seen, I think it's the Paris one where she's wearing like tennis balls as heels no. on her shoes. Yeah, like she's really nice. leaning into the whole thing. <laughs> well, as always, friends, thank you so much for listening. We'll catch you next time. Come and join in the conversation. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram at Popcorn Podcast. It's time to put a towel under your seat because we're going to talk challenges. (laughs) It's about to get moist in here.